So, uh, what I'm going to do today is talk about uh, kind of how to aspect and prototyping. That's how I understood um, a little bit the uh, kind of briefing. Uh, but I also want to give enough of a context so that you understand what goes into a project and when are decision points. And uh, this is always a negotiation. And in, in kind of physical computing classes I teach, I present in the first class how we can hold the trifactor of time, money, and quality. And you can only have two. So, uh, you know, we all do things. and. Uh, you know, one of my teachers, Daniel Liebeskind, said once, you can, we can all do great things, but we can't do them in the amount of time we have. So essentially, this is also, uh, when it comes to prototyping, I'm going to talk about the Arduino uh, kind of family, uh, but also give a little bit of context that, you know, it's not only the only, not only the only game in town, but it's also something where um, it becomes clear what is then suddenly a community effort and how you can leverage what uh, is, is called maybe a playground or a user group towards the products and the applications you're inventing. So there's a few uh, obvious kind of uh, advantages to the Arduino, so that it's a multi-platform environment, it runs on Mac, Linux, and PC Windows, and it's also a processing programming IDE, so there's already a community out there now about 70,000, uh, I'm sorry, 70,000 regular users per month. Uh, um, who update regularly. And so those folks uh, have been kind of leveraged into an Arduino open hardware project. So it's a pattern after processing, and so I'll talk for a moment how this came about. Uh, it's inexpensive, and the price point is what made the Arduino uh, very attractive, even more attractive than the actual original called wiring. And uh, it's also uh, developed for an educational context. So some of the sizes you see here are really leveraging um, human fingertips and the way that we interact with them, as opposed to taking the cheapest and the smallest of the uh, possibilities. And so that's why you see this very diverse uh, footprints here. So Arduino. Uh, we can say thanks to the Italian company Olivetti typewriters uh, that Arduino exists. Uh, interesting kind of connection there because there was the Iberia Design uh, Research Institute funded by Olivetti Company uh, in Italy where uh, Hernando Barragan uh, was studying at the time and his uh, two advisors were Casey Rees and Mario Banzi who is the inventor of the Arduino and so Banzi has already uh, before in the 90s uh, thought about how can we make hardware, uh, open hardware prototyping as accessible, cheap and educational as it could be so uh, here, a uh, very skilled designer came along who would then also present it in a way that uh, the website, the community, all the intercommunication going into it would then be accessible and uh, be kind of elevated from uh, sort of a more kind of raw, functionality-driven uh, context. So this was the first uh, iteration, $40. 34 was the Arduino. And you already see how, also you I see, I started moving over to the Arduino at some point, but it's the same language. You can program it the same way. It's alive and well, so I'm just giving you another option of four new sensors uh, which came out already this year for the wiring. And it shows that uh, this guy invented it, so they're actually very uh, fast. They're usually more capable than the Arduino's performance-wise. But it's not the only game in town. So just looking at 2003, these are two slides, just projects which try to do the same thing as Arduino uh, does. And now Arduino is kind of the Kleenex of microcontrollers, right? Uh, let's do an Arduino project as opposed to a microcontroller project. All of these um, are either um, open source projects uh, from a Max MSP, from a Java-driven point of view. Some of them came out of the MIT as well. But just to give you so a little bit of an overview of what has been out there. A few of the names, and uh, so the Atmel Studio, Atmel Studio 500 as uh, what has been uh, one of the major development environments when uh, Barogan started looking at to making this easier. So um, since the Android Accessory Development Kit, which has been uh, released uh, summer of May uh, 2011 at the Google I.O., um, this Arduino has gone, gotten even more kind of traction <coughs> because uh, it's an open hardware and open source project where um, so-called host boards have been introduced. Uh, just already full kind of disclosure that these host boards are uh, nothing you actually have to have to develop a uh, connection between the Android device and the microcontroller. Um, you can just equip it with a USB shield and then you're good to go. And that's how it looks like uh, if you take a normal Uno here on the left bottom, which is kind of the common standard. Uh, most common Arduino microcontroller. 
sort of push this shield um, on top so you have a second USB connection so you can not only connect to your uh, laptop or desktop computer to program it, but you can also then have the connection to the host device, which is the uh, Android. And so these are already, um, like this is Fridoino, one of the first um, ones which came out already with these two connections. And the Mega ADK is um, now, again, one which has been made by the Arduino makers and has therefore the stamp so that both connections are already on the board, including sort of the biggest uh, pin I.O. Uh, arrangement you can get. So if you have lots and multiples and need a lot of input, so something like this uh, is, is great. Uh, it gets less and less wearable. And that's why I um, also showed earlier. Sorry. Um, here we go. You know, the lily pads, which also Tiffany mentioned earlier. OK, so also um, the Android mode is around now uh, one and a half years in processing. So um, for folks who are scared of uh, programming and uh, usually come to me because of it um, in these classes, that means like we have now a mode where we can target Android devices and not only standalone applications. And there's a third mode, which is JavaScript making HTML5 and JavaScript powered applications. So you can target with the same uh, code the three uh, directions and cover quite a bit of spectrum there. Um, the Android mode is um, also our basis, uh, our scissors, Duran and myself, for a key type platform. Um, it's a library for uh, processing Android mode that focuses only on sensors. So we are only interested in the things which basically standalone applications can't get to and desktop computers are not uh, useful for. So uh, you can work with all sensors in the Android and the camera is also just another sensor there. Um, the networking and how to get uh, data captured um, also uh, distributed then through Wi-Fi, Bluetooth. I wish I could just give it to you right now, but that's kind of been summer. Uh, we are in version four and we have uh, publicized what's out there. It's on Google Code, so I'm going to get back to this in the end, so uh, in, in the next steps and the how-to. Always on networking is definitely part of not only your discussions here, but it's a question of where do these um, values uh, from sensors then uh, move to and how quickly and how collaboratively. So Wi-Fi, 4G, GSM networks are the three different kind of IP address an Android device would get. Uh, Bluetooth peer-to-peer -peer and Wi-Fi direct uh, since ice cream sandwich is another way to connect directly peer-to-peer, -peer, which I think is something we should also be very concerned about. Uh, the idea of having huge update rates in comparison to what you can get from infrastructure and also be off the grid and have sort of anonymous data flowing as another middle layer is something I'm very interested in personally to investigate because I think it's going to be very significant for us as we move forward. Uh, these are the bottom two. Uh, we know companies like Skype are great at you know, giving us uh, a direct Kind of connection to another device, uh, but they are very good at the so-called net busting, the translation for IP version 4 uh, into who you are actually behind, you know, your firewall and your router. And so this is um, messy, complicated, proprietary, so um, let's just remember also IP versus 6 is coming up, and so every single toaster on this planet is going to get its own IP address at some point. So, ubiquitous computing, Mark Weiser, um, just to put this out there as a kind of um, moment um, that uh, he has um, so kind of said this or set up this dialectic that uh, this ubiquitous computing would be roughly the opposite of virtual reality. Uh, we know that we have a, a much more hybrid situation if we think what sort of Jim is proposing with robotic interfaces with virtual uh, environments or what the research. Uh, Jason and Andy are pursuing here, or what Steve is uh, also researching in the media uh, environments. Uh, this hybrid situation is what we're looking at. It's not like a you know, cloud versus peer-to-peer. -peer. It's uh, it's a hybrid. And so these are just um, a few uh, terms which are out there since quite a while. And calm technologies is another term he has, uh, I think, provided us as a good way to think about what technologies are in our face all the time. And, which can go to the periphery of our perception and can calm down. So calm, okay. We're not going to make Lumen and hot and cold. Um, let's just move into some of the uh, uh, projects uh, I've been working on so I can add a little bit of an anecdotal level in terms of what decisions have been made here with Arduino um, and some prior generations of that uh, to, to uh, come up with a certain solution. 
Um, so this is a piece which uses 100 um, tactical flashlights um, connected to uh, BNC cords and kind of a control terminal to render a very low resolution picture um, from a video source. Uh, the concept behind the piece is uh, to kind of expose the thinking process of detecting suspicious movements and gate patterns. So there's a few nice papers written about sort of gate um, recognition and the symmetry and what means suspicious movement. So we asked this faculty from uh, Purdue University who is a, a performer to think about uh, sus uh, to behave suspicious. And so we kind of rendered um, the points of interest in that image which were kind of mentioned in that paper as the kind of exposing the decisions are being made in terms of what is suspicious, what is not. Including some of the Fourier transforms, etc., to get it down to a very low resolution uh, grayscale binary image, which you then see in the gallery kind of at first. So at first you see this light shower, and then you come back to detail. So what's uh, going on in the background? Here's the Arduino at work with um, some, some testing rays of LEDs. Um, here is the image being processed in real time by a processing sketch, processing talks then to the Arduino, um, and the Arduino is then talking to uh, LED drivers. So the question is often, how do I get many? Right, 100 is already too many for a board directly. So we need multiplexing or something called I2C protocol to actually talk to individual devices and talk to more. So multiplexing is definitely an interesting uh, keyword here where also the um, uh, integrated circuits uh, for just a few dollars allow you to kind of multiply the input things in it. I didn't hear so many projects who have multiples, but that's usually the next class in uh, hippie classes. So how do we get beyond one Arduino? When do we have to start networking? And um, so a little bit part of the rewiring process behind the scenes. Uh, another project here, um, 2009 Millennium Park, uh, here at UNC Studio Architects have uh, responded with this pavilion to a briefing about the Sorry if I'm going too fast, but I have not enough time. Uh, yes. Um, Burnham uh, Centennial. So this is the response here to create this kind of open stage in a public setting. Beautiful summertime. And so clearly, uh, star architects don't want technology to peak out of anywhere. Um, so here, how do you create a situation where you wouldn't even think that a camera is uh, close by or a drone is hovering around you, right? It's just not even allowed and possible. So now, OK. Um, this uh, thing cannot be dark because all the lights are, are cut uh, in the whole plaza. So myself and uh, new productions as light designers have been called in to kind of make this light sandwich, what we call it, you know. Um, and then uh, in, in an indirect light situation here, we bounced it off the perfectly rendered uh, glossy surface. So it was all about how to get this kind of smooth. But then the input, it was a problem, right? There's um, a million people expected over the duration of nine months. Um, that's why it's also such a structure. And the idea uh, was to render something like a heat map, how people move through the space. So the sensors had to be where the actual actuators were, the light sources in here host also the sensing. And so I'm just bringing this up because what happens when you put a microphone in front of the speaker, right? You get some feedback you don't like. Uh, however, it's not a big deal if you know that this is actually occurring, if you have kind of one brain processing it. So uh, in this case, um, you have a signal and that should show up here. Um, here is two light sources and these two signals. So as soon as there is some uh, change in the actual photo sensor, kind of one pixel camera, you see how these uh, signals change, but uh, the change also causes the actual change in light output uh, then to be subtracted from each other. So differentiating the two can kind of eliminate or cancel out uh, positive feedback. So when it comes to sensing and processing these things, definitely uh, a few lessons learned in this project, including if you run photo cell sensors for 100 feet, you know, you have to have good cables. And if you have uh, if you have uh, a situation like this to work in, it's getting trickier. And uh, you need to also work with computation which can handle 130 degrees and humidity. And uh, the Arduino did a perfect job over nine months. Nothing ever happened to it. So definitely a reliable situation here. But you know, there's mold, there's dust. It's just not always like you think in your drawing book. Uh, so it needs to be kind of shielded and waterproof and cables. And if you throw just a pot on top of each other, suddenly your signals all bounce. 
and you get noise and you have to rewrite the whole code on the spot again because the guys with the nail gun already closed it all up in two hours. <laughs> so that's the kind of... Uh, it has to be fire retardant. Yes, exactly. So think on the spot and uh, how to get the noise level reduced again. Um, here, uh, a recent piece uh, called Minotaur in collaboration with my partner, Renan Knezovic. This is a lab labyrinth made of 250 uh, tinsels with a metal surface. Uh, in the center, uh, there's a Van de Graaff machine which is putting out 700,000 volts um, at a very small amperage. Um, and so the Arduino was controlling basically the charge of that thing because the charge would then travel along all the surfaces and folks would move through this labyrinth and their hairs would raise and if they, yeah, that would be it. Some people who want to try how the Verde graph would work would then go close and get this kind of spark. Um, but that's, um, that was only for people who knew what was going on. But the, the charges would travel and this whole thing would then start to become this <coughs> charge animal which you come close by and you feel already the mini tower attacking you. So the Arduino helping here also to uh, as a safe kind of measure because as soon as sparks fly, this can be detected. The Arduino can then say, okay, let's stop the motors of the Van de Graaff. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the actual machine. Uh, this is uh, basically the distance with an insulator and we have a motor here. We have two different kinds of plastic materials, basically a vinyl kind of shower curtain um, rotating. And so it carries charge over there and it accumulates on the other side and you can drain it, and the, the bigger that, that gets, the more voltage you deal with. So this would be kind of 700,000 volts, this is 400, this is, you know, you can go pretty proportional with that. And that's how it looks on the inside. Um, if you look up, it's kind of 13 foot square. So why do I um, make a Kitai library with Jesus, and why certain things kind of come about uh, are projects like this, where I uh, was experimenting <laughs> with, um, with GPS devices to get the location. Here the idea is called light attack. To go to three neighborhoods one should go and three one shouldn't go in, in Los Angeles and then basically get the path and also how we move. This guy is, is basically rendered from a database of video clips. So similar discussion earlier about is it video, is it an avatar? Again, 2003 avatar, not such a banal thing to do. Here also, uh, because it's a light silhouette, it's very important to get the humanly features and reactions when he is flying with people, knocking at doors and shaking chimneys and sliding down. Um, so, but uh, the actual motion patterns are, are assembled in real time. So there is always a key point where you then move over to the next, and this needs to be sensed. So how do you sense a uh, um, vehicle in motion? Not such a banal thing, even with an accelerometer, not such a banal thing to do well. Uh, so I had to build basically all these test uh, things with accelerometers and uh, GPS and uh, in the end it ended up being just a bicycle wheel sensor attached to the car wheel which gives me audio information and with every tick I knew exactly how far we traveled so fairly immediate uh, kind of feedback and this would then be fed into a, a patch which would then control uh, the character saying no, I'm still right now we're moving let's record security kick the guy out uh, this was just, yeah, he kicked the guy out. It was a bank, but uh, it's, it's cool. Um, we, we got away because uh, the cameraman in this case was, uh, that was in Mexico City, was explaining that we're uh, shooting a soap opera so we could do everything we want. This is awesome. Can't do anything if you say you're for the telenovelas. Um, <laughs> This is also the reason why the, the navigation and GPS needed to be kind of accurate because I wanted to capture all of these paths taken in these neighborhoods and bring them back into a gallery space. Um, take basically a camera, a video camera as a still camera to assemble a seamless image of everything and scan the environment and uh, then build the path actually physically. Again, you sound old with me starting sentence like at that time but it's still true that uh, Google Earth didn't have even a patent to do what they were doing. It was called TerraVision at the time and owned by a Berlin-based art uh, creative community. So before Google Earth came to life, Street View didn't exist. There was just the Aspen moving back from 1978 kind of a, as a reference. Um, here also an interesting robotic kind of project. Um, this was a project called Nano in 2003 at the LA County Museum of Art. Um, in the laboratory, so also for young audiences, and there were like uh, altogether eight installations um, I produced with the Sukumaran 
uh, Victoria Mesa, James Zinzeski were the scientists and uh, behind the project, nanoscientists. So it was about how to get nanotechnology and have commuted to, uh, communicated to a younger audience. So you have here this uh, autonomous robotic kind of atoms rolling around on a molecular floor. So this floor was rendered and was vibrating like a molecular interactions would be in an atomic force microscope uh, situation. So uh, essentially these atoms would be pushed around seemingly magically and uh, later on it would be clear uh, this would happen in a remote room. So you would have these four uh, trackballs also perfectly vandal safe. All of these things have to hold up for many people. And so if you would roll these guys you would then see an image um, projected in front of you which kind of looks more like this. So thinking about the infrared you know, goggles uh, invented this is the infrared image of the whole inner space. So you can both project in the same space and still track what's going on. And if you move these trackballs, you would move these um, spheres and you would see them light up. So we put like infrared LEDs inside the, these spheres. And as soon as you move them, they would give you directional feedback. So you can kind of atomically force these uh, atoms to move around on the surface. And again, sort of a two-step spatial narrative where you first come in and interact with these things and then later know why. Um, yes, this is how it looks behind the scenes and uh, how I found out about microcontrollers and uh, bit shifting. That's how I learned about it. Uh, in the oscilloscope, same signal, checking what's going on. Packing into pre-existing kind of industry gear. So this is like now uh, an optical encoder, again, very big, but as soon as you start things reading out, you, you learn that the Arduino uh, and UPIC cannot handle the Arduino Nexus, um, cannot handle the speeds of um, the encoder being rotating all the time, so we had to still write assembly code and make a, a decoder for it and then get into this higher level microcontroller to then um, control the actual robotics. Uh, this I also put in there just because all of these spheres were identical, they listened to the same signal, so you can't just put an RC system in there, a cheap one, and because everything listens to the same signal. To separate them meant like setting out the packets first, who is this message for, where do you have to go, and then the actual controls for direction. So now, um, obviously, uh, these guys are equipped with uh, gyroscope, accelerometers, digital compass, uh, GPS, um, all of these good things which the prior project all would have liked. Um, and so uh, this project um, for data interpretation, Kitai library uh, for processing Android, is trying to make this um, fairly accessible, sort of get down the Android uh, code kind of by factor 10, um, so you can register a sensor and actually get the information and keep it within the processing ID, basically. Uh, it's made for data fusion, so you could read out whatever you like and then write applications. Uh, in this case, that we create the path taken. A little time-based browser of what happens to the phone over time. And you can hide and show uh, what sensors give you what kind of error. And so, a internal analysis tool made right there. Um, also, trying to think about sensors in a broad sense, but NFC uh, as a radio frequency RFID kind of technology uh, also gives us um, the possibility to know what objects are around us. Looking a little bit forward, but basically the payment industry is very keen on NFC becoming a point of sale. New paradigm, so that's why I put it in there as well. It's very inexpensive stickers could, could potentially be and are in many, many objects already. So if you pass by in very close proximity, you know, four uh, centimeters for security reasons, then you would actually get this information too. Android also has some very nice, uh, you know, already built-in features. So this is an ice cream sandwich already part of the camera. So face recognition, you just get off the bat. You know who's looking at it, the distance of the eyes. So certain UI uh, aspects definitely might be interesting that way. So we built it into the Kita library and you get uh, an integer which shows you how many faces and where the eyes are. So um, to throw in some kind of how-to stories from last semester, maybe to embarrass some of the uh, folks who are sitting here. Um, mm -hmm. I think some, some, some are here, I think. Do you recognize your projects? Yes, Victor. Can I talk about it, or should I summarize how I see it? 
<laughs> well, the health bar is uh, actually uh, has it's, it's such a great title that we try to give these projects title right away because you have to work through what is it actually about. Right? The health bar uh, idea and human semantics is very well known here, but Victor made a pretty kind of sleek encapsulated design where all the Arduino stuff would be, um, yeah, kind of uh, in in that plastic diffuser system would have an LED which could change color and also show only certain. Um, parts being on and so over time you would see how your health bar fades away because you didn't move enough. So there was a motion sensing as well as an input PIR, PIR sensor, what was it again? Yes. Yes. And so that would be the input uh, to detect whether you're there or not. And so in the refinement of this the question is uh, also if PIR is the best way to do it or if it does need already to be a hybrid between different mm -hmm. sensors. And so Alessandro made this uh, sort of wind chime which is uh, a telematic uh, piece, so you have exactly two of them, and you would then have basically the presence of the other uh, person passing through that remote space being immediately uh, sonified uh, without any additional technology. So he went at great lengths to build a messaging kind of library for the Arduino to not have any PC in between. I'm not sure if it made it already to his mother in Italy. Is he here too? But I think that was the idea too. Right? Remoteness doesn't matter if it's next door and the EVL lab, or if it's mm -hmm. if it's inspired by remoteness to his family. Um, so we have here, and that's actually one project here. So Francesco's um, concerns were about uh, coffee temperature. Is he here, Francesco? Mm -hmm. No. Okay. So obviously, um, an important subject: whether you drink your coffee too too cold or. Uh, too hot, and so he would find out the exact sweet spot for it by this metal plate as a conductor, a heat conductor, and then would detect below um, how hot it was and give them all the feedback with LEDs like your red rim or a blue one, just a halo um, with, with the LEDs of what's going on. So, Palm technology is pretty encapsulated, and he wanted to go pretty far in terms of a product to get it actually to the size. You know, there's a shower head now you can buy that does something similar. Okay. So you plug it into your shower and okay. turn the water. If, if it's red, it's too hot. If it's green, it's perfect. And if it's blue, it's All too right. <laughs> right. Okay. Ten bucks on Amazon. You buy one. I need to get that shower. <laughs> In a way, I also want to be in charge of how hot I want it, not my shower gun. Right. But it, it would be cool to know what's good for you. <laughs> so we have here um, another project here in the in the bottom of the base. Yeah, this is Search and Rescue, again the title, pretty pretty clear what it's about. Uh, Paul and Brad were uh, mining uh, Google News in terms of, uh, sort of local helicopter starts, and so as soon as uh, there would be a new Search and Rescue report, it, it would launch, and obviously the uh, difficulty was here to get a, a good start, safe landing, and to make this kind of uh, uh, ongoing procedure, and scared the hell out of both of them testing it because obviously you don't you don't expect it. So in terms of calm technology is a very rupture, so pretty much like something's launching in the corner, so it's pretty violent. Um, here, uh, Joshua's project, uh, yes, which you wanted to show, right, over there? Yeah. Yes. So here's some Bluetooth going on already, maybe it helps your project, but um, the sensor itself, which is a microphone, right, not a wind sensor, uh, sorry, not a breath or any other sensor. It's a microphone, right? When you blow into it, it makes noise, so the detection can sometimes be different than you might think in terms of the sensor you look for. And the lily pad as well. Uh, it's very externalized, not quite product ready. I kind of love that you get so yes. externalized. It makes you look very cyberpunk. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Jason just signed up for being a tester. <laughs> yeah. Happy to. What is a test? <laughs> Yeah, we, we, I think we can make it still over there. I'm, I'm coming to an end. Um, Kita library here, Google Code, if you want to browse there. Uh, there's already the ADK classes in there. Not very well documented right now because I'm supposed to finish a book in the next eight weeks about it. So in the fall, it's going to be out. Uh, at least as a better book, and I hope that some of you help um, so, test. Mm -hmm. So that's really awesome. So does that mean that most of these, most of these students are going to use uh, Eclipse and do all their development with their Android development kit and all that kind of stuff. I mean, processing is so much nicer. I and mean, if you're going to you just leverage this, it'd be so much easier to get this work done. Absolutely. I mean, we use b both Eclipse and, and processing, but 
most recently not Eclipse anymore at all yeah. because we just import an additional task which we might be interested in our context or keyboard. Right. It's just um, hiding the fact that Java is all just there and yeah. uh, you can write pure Java in, in it as well. Obviously then you don't leverage anything, but you can leverage all of uh, this, this good um, visualization techniques and other libraries which are yeah, there as well. Nice yeah. Yeah. So I mean, processing is all about the libraries. Right? You, don't, you don't need processing if you don't use the libraries, but there's more than 100 and they are really, I mean, that's when you add productivity to your project. Yeah. And that's it. Fantastic.